Unfiltered, the official Sunderland AFC podcast. Hello and welcome to SAFC Unfiltered, the official SAFC podcast sponsored by Alpha Security. Myself, Frankie Francis, and former player Danny Collins are up at the Academy of Light this morning to speak to sporting director Christian Speakman. It's been a little while since we've done a podcast, so it's lots to uh, catch up with Christian and with ourselves as well, Danny, I guess. There's lots to uh, reflect on. It's been a busy start to the season, but a successful one. Well, it has, hasn't it? And uh, looking at the, the back end of last season, we finally managed to get out of League One, back up into the Championship, and it's been a, a pretty solid start, I'd say. Um, you know, we're 10 games in now. As you said earlier on, we're, we're looking at the table a little bit, and we've been we've been solid. I think we've played some good football, and uh, we look like we're at home at, at Championship level. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, i say a good break now for the lads, rest and recover, and get ready to go again. It's been a busy period of time for Christian with players coming into the club, lots of players leaving the club as well, first team coach leaving, appointment of a new first team coach. It's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say because the fans want answers on a few things and certainly don't want to be left in the dark about any of these subjects. Yeah, that's right. It's never never smooth at Sunderland, is it? But um, got off to a good start and then the manager leaves. But no credit to the boys. They reacted well, uh, carried on where they left off really and, and Tony's come in and, and got them going again. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to what Christian's got to say I'm sure the fans will want to hear from him and uh, we'll probe him and see what we can get out of him OK then let's head through these glass doors here up the Academy of Light and go and speak to Christian Speakman Welcome back to SAFC Unfiltered some sporting director Christian Speakman How are you doing Christian? Really good guys, morning This is your sixth appearance on the podcast you have passed everyone's expectations in terms of appearance uh, numbers You mean um, I've lasted that long? <laughs> that <was my> <laughs> Well, a lot has changed at the club in your time here, your, your short time at the club. Um, how are you doing? Um, what's, what have you been up to today? What's an average day look like for Christian Speakman around the uh, Well, thankfully it's, uh, it's calmed down a little. Last, uh, last month or two has been really, really hectic. and I, it's Often you don't quite realise how hectic it's been until, um, until obviously you get after that sort of transfer window period. I think it was the first time I'd sat down and had sort of a Sunday dinner in my family. I know it wasn't Sunday yesterday, but um, over this weekend it was just like... Really, really strange to sort of get back into sort of normal working so um, a lot of things across all the rest of the domains at the minute trying to improve what we're trying to do and uh, try to uh, try to move the project forward so since we last spoke we've gained promotion to the championship we've said goodbye to players and a first team coach we've welcomed many players and a new first team coach as well where should we start let's look at the promotion because that's a, a huge positive and something which I guess was on your <laughs> list of achievements you wanted to, to do here at Sunderland Football Club and you've done that quite in quite a short space of time. First of all, tell us how it, how it felt for you personally and what it's done for the club. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, it was a number one objective for us sitting in League One when we came in and we didn't really have a timeline on where we felt that would be most appropriate. Obviously, the sooner the better. Team performed really, really well last year in probably two big segments you know the first half of the season where we were averaging promotion points per game and the last sort of 16 games was sort of points per game was promotion we had a bit of a dip in the middle um, personally obviously it's a huge achievement to come to to come to Sunderland um, in the sort of position and situation it was and to in essence be part of a team that turns that around um, you know it was a really really proud day for me my family my two kids were at the game um, and I suppose at the time it's a bit surreal, but obviously when you start to reflect on it, you understand obviously there's some really good work going on. And it's down to the team and it's down to the team behind the team. You know, I think we've managed to reshape the squad to something that we think is more aligned to what we would like it to be. And we've got a sort of a behind the scenes, you know, at AOL, we've got a, a team of staff now and a developing team of staff of experts who are all super motivated for, for Sunderland to achieve, whether that's a academy level, whether that's within the women's game, whether that's the men's senior team, there's, there's a lot of alignment across that. But on a personal note, like really, really proud of the group, really, really proud of everyone that's obviously bought into what we're trying to do. And obviously that's created some success. And on that day at Wembley, on that weekend at Wembley, did you have to stop and pinch yourself in terms of the, the huge sporting story, which was Sunderland Football Club coming back through the leagues in terms of, you know, it was... Sunderland fans took over London that weekend, as they have done in recent years as well. 
uh, as there's still conversations with yourself and members of staff who maybe haven't been around that long and, and you think, wow, why are we the main story on Sky Sports News? Why are we the main story on the news for taking over London? And obviously when you're inside the stadium and you see how, how much we dwarf the Wickham support, is that a real you know, pinch yourself moment? Yeah, it is. I think at the, at the time when you're living it, and unfortunately in my type of work, your focus is elsewhere. Your focus is on the team, your focus is on preparation, your focus is on, um, you know, the sort of getting the job done piece. Um, you know, it is, it, is, it is a, like I said, it's probably slightly surreal. I think the other day my wife had it on some sort of social media and she showed me again, like, you know, it's crazy the amount of people I was like, and when you get those moments and people sort of come to you and want to discuss it or chat to it, or whether it's that type of moment, that's when it starts to sink in in terms of, you know, the the magnitude and the number of people it matters to, I think is the most important thing. You know, I think obviously as a professional, you want to achieve, you want to achieve for yourself, your team, your club, your owner. But when you look at the actual sort of like ripple effect, the amount of people that I come across now on a daily basis who want to chat about Wembley, want to chat about London and what a great football club, you know, it, it is to have that sort of supporter base and that vibrancy around it. it, it you know, it, it matters a lot. It's a huge thing for the players. It's a huge thing for the people connected to the club. Yeah, we were obviously down there the day before, weren't we? And we had a little walk through Trafalgar Square to sort of soak up the atmosphere and get used to it. And it was uh, it was ridiculous, wasn't it? And then obviously inside the stadium as well, we'd, we'd done a little bit pitch side for the club. Um, and just the atmosphere I've played in, obviously in, in front of some good crowds over the years, but just being in there as a fan really on the day throughout the game and the atmosphere was something else, wasn't it? Was it 45 plus thousand Sunderland fans? From your point of view, was it difficult to try and take that in as well? Obviously, you're probably focused on what's going on on the pitch, hoping that we can get over the line whilst getting through a few fingernails, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I just felt we were super prepared for the game and I, and I had every confidence in the coaching staff and the players that we'd be able to execute our game plan. Um, you know, it was interesting because Ross scored, I think it was about 10 minutes from the end, wasn't it? I actually left... I went down, I went out the back, I actually got a glass of wine with about five minutes to go. Was that celebrating early or? It was, I, 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 I <laughs> taking the yeah, edge I off. mean, I just felt super, con I felt really confident we'd win the game at that point with five minutes to go, two yeah. to look, I thought we were in control and I just wanted literally two minutes to myself, which sounds probably a little bit strange, but at the moment, at the time, I just wanted two minutes just to sort of like take it in myself um, because it's obviously a big achievement and obviously, you know, there's a... It, it means so much to a lot of people yeah. and obviously as a football club, as a business. So, um, you know, really, really proud of that achievement. And obviously, you know, it's just a one small part of what we want to achieve here. So I guess thoughts then quickly turn to the plan for the, the following season. And we had a, a summer of friendlies. We had a two of Portugal as well. We played some big, big clubs over there as well. Uh, and we came home and played some uh, away games as well as friendlies. Uh, at that period of time, I'd imagine you're in full speed ahead in terms of the transfer window, yourself and the recruitment team and the stack guys here, or data analysts, they're all looking at lists of players, aren't you? And at the time, you're working with Alex Neal and his coaching staff as well. Uh, how did you feel the summer went in terms of preparation for the championship? Yeah, I think the, the first thing to note is it's an extremely short window for us when you get promoted via our method. <laughs> And obviously the season started a week earlier. We were, it was a really condensed summer period. It was a condensed period from a, prep, a physical preparation point. The boys hardly get any time off really. And we'll try to adjust for that through this season as well to make sure we can maintain the sort of level required. Naturally, you know, your, your, your squad composition question comes up straight away because it's a new level. I have to be honest with you, our recruitment in the previous windows was all designed to try and make sure we had players capable of playing championship football. So whilst, yeah, we did make a number of signings, there's still a lot of players in our, I think for the first three or four games, I think it was basically the same team that played last year, bar one or two spots, because we believed in the group. Um, so everything that we've been doing has always been looking sort of 12, 24 months ahead. Um, and I think that's obviously the primary part of my role is, is to try to future plan and future proof ourselves to a certain degree on what's going on. Um, but we did, we did obviously have to do quite a lot of work in a short space of time. Really pleased in terms of how it sort of transpired. You know, I sometimes say like you don't get the Disney storyline, you know, you can't work in exactly the right order you want to because you're at the mercy of other clubs, you know, player decisions, etc. But I felt that we managed to work through in a really sequential order. We tried to target the players that we wanted to sign permanently first because um, we felt that was really, really important. And we would supplement that with the relevant loans and other positions. In the end, I think we only, we only took two loans that were not loans to permanence. 
Um, so we don't want to rely on that market too mm -hmm. much. We want to have our players, we want people invested in what's going on here that are part of uh, being at Sunderland. So I'm really, really pleased with it, really. Um, I know I said this in the previous, I think it might have been Tony's um, press conference. Our transfer business will always draw scrutiny because of the size of club we are and the, the number of eyes and, and, and ears on obviously what goes on. Um, and we have to be accountable for that, and I have no issue for that. But we're we're really happy with the squad. Obviously, we have a small issue at the minute in terms of, you know, Ross and Ellis are both out. That draws some attention. For us, we're more than comfortable with the group that we've got. Um, our, our model was to design a team to play 4-3-3. That had the flexibility to play 3-4-3 and 3-5-2. We started off the season playing 3-5-2, but that was just down to how we felt the best way of winning those particular games against that particular opposition. And had it been different opposition, we may have started with a 4-3-3. Um, and therefore, we've got two players for every position. And the only position we haven't got two players for is left back. Um, but we've got Dennis and, and we've got Adji, obviously, we feel can cover there. Um, and look, we've just been a bit unfortunate with that. But we've got every faith in the other players to be able to play our identity. And, and it's something that Tony's 100% on board with. Yeah. Do you know, in terms of, obviously, you're covering, you mentioned that two, two players for each position. And it's obviously going to get onto the one where... I think fans will look once the window's closed. Have we strengthened in every position? You know, you'll say that some deals fall through last minute. You're looking at other players, and it's never going to come off. It's never going to be rosy, and you know, you're going to get every signing that you're looking for. Unfortunately, the window closes. You can't predict when we're going to pick up injuries. We lose Ross in the warm-up at the Borough game, and then we lose Ellis at, uh, at Reading as well. Twenty minutes or so on the clock. Um, so ideally, we're short in terms of centre forwards, aren't we? Were you perhaps looking at bringing in another striker to back up them? If we were looking at playing two up top this season, I know you mentioned 4-3-3, we've started 3-5-2, looking at maybe cover, I know we've got uh, Max Thompson, is it doing well in the, in the 23s? Um, would you still be looking now at strengthening, although Ross is going to be a few weeks, isn't he? Ellis not too far away. Yeah, no, I mean, if I think if our model was to play two up the top, we probably would have more numbers in that area because naturally you'd be looking to play two every week. Our, our structure was to play once and that, naturally that would have been Ross and that would have been Ellis to him to fight that spot out. And then we would have also, you know, we wanted some tactical flexibility and some difference in the team. You know, so we felt that with Adam Adam, with Leon, we had that, um, you know, sort of those four for two spaces. Naturally, when you do play 4-3-3, three, three, then the sort of, the, the natural thought is you want a, a bigger, stronger uh, player at yeah. the top end of the pitch. But it doesn't mean you have to play that way, you know. Ahmad played up front for Man United in the pre-season in, in a similar shape. Leon played for us against Roma in a similar shape. And both individually within those two sets of games did really, really well. And we think we've got enough quality. The question is always going to be is, you know, we can go, we can go out tomorrow and get a number nine that externally maybe people go, oh, we've got number nine. Yeah. But if he doesn't get in front of Leon, doesn't get in front of Ahmad. <laughs> Right there. There's absolutely zero point in average. I suppose as well there, you're looking at someone who's out of contract, who's sitting around, maybe yeah. ageing a little bit perhaps, and then you're thinking, is it worth bringing them in at that short space of time? Well, as I say, Ellis perhaps isn't going to be too far off as he, the, the international yeah. breaks come at the right time, and then you're hoping Ross comes back as well, so we can sort of fit lads in around that until until these two boys are fit, yeah? Yeah, and, and look, the question then will be, well, should we have done something before the window end? But it was it's the same question. Yeah. It's just that... You know, we were always looking at where we can strengthen and what, and what type of player we can get in. And, and we brought Ahmad in to do that job. And, and it'll be up to Ahmad to, to be able to show that he can do that job to the level. Mm -hmm. And then we'll obviously, you know, like I said, we'll be accountable for how well those players do. But um, I don't think it's something that, that, that our fan base and supporters should be worrying about. You know, I think internally we've, we've watched all those games. You know, if you look at someone like a Leon, you know, when he's played in his under-19 year, he plays 70% of his games as a, as a striker. You know, so it's not something that we're thinking is too different for him mm -hmm. and it's something that we had in the plan at the start but ultimately it, you know those players have to do well enough in training as Tony's quite rightly said where they have done well they've got opportunity like they did on Saturday and then hopefully they can come on and, and demonstrate to everyone the quality that we've all seen out of them we have been unlucky I guess with injuries uh, someone who started the season really well was one of the first people you recruited this season Dan Ballard mm. he looked really good at the back and then you know found himself Going to see that you know in the injury bay, you know, and you know he had a, such a great start. But how excited are you for Dan and his career at Sunderland? Yeah, look, Dan, Dan had a great start, and we're good for Dan because you know he he got into a bit of a rhythm where I think he was attracting a lot of positive attention for how well his performances are done. 
and then you know he gets a he gets a contact injury, which are really really hard to navigate away from because, like you said, they're just facts of the occurrences within the games. I don't think he even got a yellow card, by the way, for that. The lad who yeah, did it on well, him. We watching that. Don't get me started on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, yeah, I think it, look, it's really frustrating. In in performance sport, no one's look, let's be honest, no one's interested in bad luck and this that and the other. It comes down to you know results and, and the development of our players. You know, we went from having a uh, a squad list with literally no injuries on it week in week out through pre-season our performance staff and our medical staff did an incredible job within that short period to get everyone up to speed without creating an injury you know they should be commended for the work that went on um, and then when the season starts all of a sudden you're looking at the list and four of your starting 11 are out injured yeah. you know and there's two contacts you know um, and then there's two muscle injuries one of which is in the warm up Dennis as well isn't it? Yeah, um, but look our our journey to be a really, really successful team and a really successful club means we've got to be able to work against adversity, bad luck, you know, opinion on this, whatever it might be, bad, bad form. We've got to find a way of getting results. We've got to find a way of players doing well. So I don't really have an issue with us overcoming this matter. And I think it'd be good for everyone internally and externally to understand that, you know, we have to find a way. And finding a way can't always be signing another player or doing you know what I mean it's, yeah. it's it's being creative with the situation that we've got and that's one of our core values is being creative if we could go into some more of the the players that have came in individually yeah. because for many Sunderland fans football fans you won't have heard of any of these names however they are seem to be very exciting young players which fits the model if you wouldn't mind going into how the model works and how you came across these players we've seen flashes from Jefferson Bennett at the the weekend. We've seen flashes from from Abdullah Bar as well at the weekend. Uh, Ahmad uh, obviously came in with a big reputation from Manchester United, um, and Ajay Alise as as well, who's played brilliant the last couple of games. Can you just remind supporters and perhaps uh, outlay what the the model is here, which you've helped shape in your in your time here at the club, and how these players fit in, and how you found these players. Well, first of all, I mean, the players that have come in have done, have done outstanding in terms of adapting to Sunderland, adapting to the Championship, adapting to England in some of the cases. Um, and I think, you know, we're certainly with those younger players, you do get that, that adaptability. You know, there is, a, there is a, a lack of fear, if you like, in, in, in certain regards, and there is an openness to change and an openness to getting better. Like, look, our, our, model, our model is to... And, and our purpose is to create a, a football team which the supporters are proud of you know and I think what you're starting to see or I'm starting to get the feeling of is people are excited to watch our team they're excited to see you know which players are playing they're excited to see the games I think you know I'm most proud of the fact that I think we're almost two years since I've been at the club and all and I think the way that our team plays is a lot lot different to obviously what I inherited and that's down to obviously you know like all 60 65 members of staff that we have here at the academy that are doing something in some regard whether you're young players or old players but we're, we're about trying to create that type of team and that, that that team can be successful and then it's just a concept of how do you do that do you sign older players do you sign younger players do you sign this type of player do you sign that type of player and, you, and in, within the championship you can see all types of models and there's lots of ways of doing things and, and we're not suggesting that ours is the best way we're just saying that this is the this is the model that we believe in and what we're trying to do is get value and balance you know we we have a lot of emphasis on the young players we cannot underestimate the value of Luke O'Neill, Gooch, Bath, Evans, Pritchard in that group because young players have to look at other players and go right okay what's this all about you know Daniel you know what what does a top pro look like what what does a top pro do and you need those role models in the group and what I feel that we've got I think we've got the right balance in terms of um, the type of older players we've got and how they're going about their business and the types of young players. And I think you see the right characters. You know, you look at the adversity, okay, we're up against, we lose, you know, uh, strikers, we're one nil down, we come back to one one, we go two one down, we come back to two two. The attitude and the approach of the group is a fearless group that just want to constantly try to achieve. And therefore, I think that's something that you can get behind. And we just think that, obviously, from a young player perspective, we want to try to develop value in the squad. We want to develop a group. We're not in the position where we're going to go out and spend millions and millions and millions of pounds to get a ready-made team, which happens in some places. That's not our model. 
But I think if you look at the uh, transfer business over the summer, we're probably the third highest net spenders in the league. And you consider we're a promoted team, third highest net spenders. It's all right spending money if you know if you sell a player for fifty million and you spend twenty. Yeah. <laughs> you still made 30 <laughs> whereas you look at ours we're probably the third highest net spenders so I think there's been incredible ambition shown by the ownership to invest in the right types of players that can deliver for now and obviously can grow with the team so if you look at an Anagi we feel that an Anagi can come in understand what we're about and can buy into that and obviously we think he's got the right performance level and I think he's demonstrated that and then you've got some other ones which may be a little bit further away in terms of Ahmad and Edward, where obviously they are under-19 internationals come from a proven establishment of developing players at Le Havre and PSG. Um, and we're, we're trying to obviously capitalise on the fact that we can, we can identify, find and attract those players into our model. Um, so, you know, ultimately it's about trying to develop a winning team. <laughs> I, everyone wants a winning team now, don't we? We live, in a, we live in a world of immediacy and we are trying to win now. <laughs> But we're not doing that at the expense of trying to build and, and establish ourselves. Yeah, funny enough, I'd done a Q and A Q&A at the stadium a couple of weeks ago, actually, with the senior supporters branch. And uh, shout out of, to them. Yeah, and uh, one of the guys in the in the audience, he shouted out, he said, "Say, well, what is our game plan? What is our model? Are we looking to bring in a lot of young players? Hopefully, they turn into decent players, and we can sell them for money. Are we becoming a selling club, or are we looking at?" kicking on again and trying to get up to the Premier League with a built squad. So you've sort of answered that in a way, really, haven't you? You're looking at, yes, we bring these young lads in. We're hoping that they can develop and, and come on the journey with us. And whether it's one year, five years, if we can get back to the Premier League and these lads being part of that, I guess. Yeah, you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to build that team. Naturally, there is a trading element to any professional yeah. sport, whether that's, you know, the franchise sports in America, whether it's obviously our, our league system. It's an incredible compliment, isn't it, to everything that goes on here that you've got players that other clubs want to buy. You yeah. know, so from that perspective, it's a backhand of compliment. So I have no issues with all that because I think that just drives the positive of you can come to something you can achieve. It's up to us then to try to retain those players. And I'm sure there'll be times as we go through that we'll be selling players, you know, and we'll be reinvesting that, reinvesting that money. Um, and that's got to be based on when we feel that's most appropriate. I just think that's just a normal methodology of being able to gravitate yourself to the top. You know, you look at some of the teams in the Premier League that are doing really, really well at the minute. They had that background. They went through that journey. Um, so I don't think we should be afraid of that. I think we should see that as a positive, that Sunderland is a place where, you know, you can play, you can perform, you can achieve. Naturally, we want to carry those players through, don't we? But we also have to appreciate that some of the players, we're talking about really talented players, they might out, out, outgrow the club. Yeah. And... That's just, I think that's just natural. Practically speaking, how do you discover a teenager in Costa Rica and decide that he's ideal for Sunderland yeah. at a five-year deal? Who's been on holiday there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the open-mindedness of this football club that you've got now. You know, I don't think there is an issue around language. There's not an issue around culture. Um, there is, there is a really, really openness to what's the type of talent we could come and you know. Trying to develop that exciting, hard-working, industrious, creative team, then you know you want to have a little bit of a mix, and we're just trying to we're just trying to identify the talent that we can get the right value, you know, that we that we think can come in. And um, our recruitment team, led by Stuart, have done an incredible job since you know we sort of formed and created that team. They're an incredible help for myself, Steve, and Carol because they're they're undergoing all the relevant due diligence that you'd, you'd require which is both qualitative in terms of watching the games and quantitative with the numbers to try to make sure we're in a position to make the best decision and then you've got to do legwork you know Stuart Harvey's out in Costa Rica bless him I think he thought there was going to be some sun when he got there it rained every day <laughs> so it's just as well we got a good signing out of the back of it he could be frustrated but you know Stuart's out there watching two games spending time with the family convincing the boy that Sunderland's the best place to go and, you know, I think everyone's seen the sort of talent this kid's got. You know, it wasn't, Sunderland wasn't his only option. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, like, you've got to go and you've got to convince. And that's where I think our football club um, can, be really, can, can, really, can be really positive because we're not just relying on an agent to communicate our message. We're on the flight. We're out there. We're in the face. We're, we're presenting our, our project and we're giving them an insight into what it is. And all of a sudden, the players want to come. And, and that's, down, that's down to Stuart and his team when it gets to that point. And then obviously everything else that goes on around formation of contracts, etc., to make sure we get the best deal. So I guess Stuart's well briefed and well, um, you know, always planning a, with the model in mind as well as an integral part of that. Yeah, I mean, when we, when we get into the transfer window post the games, you know, 
myself, Stuart, um, you know, are probably, you know, we, our last call most nights will be 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m. every night. So you've got to look at the amount of time these people are putting into, the, you know, into what it is. So there's no stone left unturned. And, you know, whether it's um, trips away, whether it's watching the videos, having the meetings, it's a, almost a, I don't know, 18, 20, 20 hour day, you know, and, and you have to do that because it's a, it's a finite amount of time before that window shuts. And you've got some really, really key decisions to make. Um, yeah, no, so look, really, really proud of those guys for the amount of work they put in and not just the amount of work, the quality of work as well, because I think everyone can be like, oh, people have worked hard. The quality of the work that sort of Matt, Paul and Stuart have put in has been incredible. Uh, I guess as well as the players coming in and out, um, the model, if you like, would have helped support the transition of the first team coach. You were quite honest um, on the, the morning of the news break and you spoke to, I think it was David Craig on Sky, you came out and answered... Honestly, your situation, the club's situation, and how things were transpiring at that moment, uh, some found themselves with the first-team coach walking away, and you had to recruit a new one. With the, in the model which you've touched upon, was there always a contingency plan? Yeah, we, we said before, we've always ran uh, an ongoing contingency plan. I think any business would do that for a, what you probably class as executive-level type position. Um, look, we got a lot of scrutiny last time, which, fair, unfair, I'll leave other people to judge that. We, we wanted to make sure that we made the right decision when we, re when we recruited Alex, and we're quite specific around our need to get out of the league. And, and obviously, we think that that was a good decision in hindsight. But what we also did in that period of time was we also spoke to a lot of other people. Um, Tony actually wasn't one of those, just for absolute clarity, because otherwise it's going to make it uh, a difficult conversation. We had a load of conversations. But we've been tracking lots of different coaches externally. But then when we came around to this change, we obviously had had lots of conversations we could already draw back on. We're running some data and we're running some understanding about how coaches are done at different teams. And Tony was someone that we, 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 we've long admired because, you know, you look at his loyalty and his, his, his length of stay at Blackburn, but he also had the second youngest team last year. So you talk about balancing development with performance I don't think anyone's done that better than Tony recently for the amount of time he's done it, um, you know, to achieve that level of performance at Blackburn with obviously his second youngest squad. So once we were in the position of we knew where it was sort of going with Alex, I embarked on that conversation with Tony so I could add that conversation to all the other conversations I had previously, all the rest of the information and, and start to distill that down and come up with what we think was the best decision. And my, you know, our proposition to, to Kira was that we felt Tony was the, the best the best option for us. Naturally it was something maybe we could do a little bit quicker um, because we felt that that was going to be important certainly in terms of the league you know and you know I think he's come in and done a really really good job and really really embraced what we're all about whether that's technical you know football bit or whether that's understanding the region and what we're about as a football club. Yeah I think um, obviously what you know touching on Alex Neil great job he done that's a Graft, you know, lost that one game, didn't he, in 16, I think, just to get into the playoffs. Um, MK Dons, wasn't it? MK Dons, wasn't it, early on, yeah. And then this season, off to a good start, I'd say, you never know how it's going to go with it, as you mentioned earlier. Um, some young lads coming into it haven't played at championship level before, but I think we beat Stoke away, we're up to fifth in the table, and news started filtering through, I think, on the Friday, wasn't it, Friday afternoon, that perhaps he was in talks with, with Stoke. Um, and then it's not ideal prep on a Friday before a game against Norwich, a team have just come down. Um, lads were fantastic the next day actually but you just mentioned there that going back to when Lee Johnson left and then it took 12 days to to bring Alex Neal in um, obviously we had those couple of games in between which didn't go for us was it Doncaster I think wasn't it and Cheltenham which we lost yeah. both um, so everything sort of comes down on top really but now was that sort of a conscious decision this time round then that a couple of days once Alex Neal had left we need to get someone in sharpish and you said you'd already perhaps spoke to Tony and lined things up maybe well, we, we, our first conversation was, was, was with Tony Post, obviously, Alex, Alex sort of uh, departing. I, don't, I think it's about, I said before, it's about making the right decision um, at the right time. And last time we felt that to get to the right decision, we, we, we went through a number of processes, which we did exactly the same, but we were, man we were able to fast track that a little bit over sort of three, four day period. I think, um, I think it just comes down to that, that the context of that, that, that moment and... When you've got more information as we did, it was easy to make a quicker decision. The last time we had to, 
We had a few more bits of information to sort of process through. And the conundrum, if you like, was slightly different in terms of where we were in the league yeah. at that point in the season and you know, what was going to be the best option and, and a, a few other things that are going around at the same time. So for us, it was a lot, it was a lot clearer on this occasion in terms of what we required. And like you said, when you when you start looking at Tony's CV and you're stacking that up, and then you're stacking, you know, I spent um, that weekend three hours with him on one of the days, you know, looking at obviously all the different things. All of a sudden, it starts to become really, really clear that he's probably the best candidate for the job. Um, you take a bit of time to reflect. You have the conversation with the owner, you know, and then and then you, and then you make that decision. So he ticked a lot of boxes. You just there working with the was it the second youngest squad last year with yeah. Blackburn, wasn't it? Yeah. He knows the area well. Bags of experience at this level as well behind me. He took West Brom up, didn't he, a few years ago as well. So uh, yeah. five years at, at Blackburn and yeah. done a reasonable job there. So Yeah, and look, we've also got um, Tony and, and, and Vino, in fairness, they've got a lot of experience. And we've got a really, really young, in, enthusiastic, energetic workforce. So I think as well, that's a quite a nice mix at the minute for for those guys to have that support and also that insight, whether that's in talent ID, whether that's in performance, whether that's in player development. I think that's a really, really nice mix and you've seen that you've seen that uh, occurring already. Does he come um, across as the sort of arm around type of manager, Tony, or has he got a, can he tee off at the players when he needs to? Because you've seen oh, yeah, no, yeah, where he yeah, said yeah, Jack yeah, Clark yeah. just needs an arm around him, tell him how good he is and Patrick just needs to get playing and we know what talent he is, that type. Yeah, I think, I mean, Tony would say himself, I think, you know, he sees himself as a developer of people. So his natural, I think, start point is how can I help this person get better? You know, that, that's a complete like alignment, obviously, the way that which we're going to approach our, our football club. And he's, he's got that as his start point. Has he got teeth? Yeah, he's got teeth, you know. <laughs> and has he got standards and has he got an understanding around what's required, when it's required? Of course he has. You yeah. don't get to manage a number of games. Time, time, a, yeah. You know, and I, I think the the most impressive thing about him is 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 the is the balance and when to use what tool where. You know, I've seen that with him already. Um, you know, and it's always difficult, isn't it? You're picking up a team, you come in in the middle of the season. You know, I think the there should be a lot of credit given as well to the people behind the scenes. And I know they don't always necessarily get the credit, but you know, when when Alex comes in, you know, we had Mike Dodds and Mike Proctor took a lot of criticism because we lost the games. Yeah. But the lads come off but, the back of a 6 0 hide and yeah, Bolton, didn't they? So they, they did. But also, conference. the reason that Alex was able to get going really, really quickly is because Proc and Dodsey were, were, had it all sorted out and all underpinned, and it makes it a lot easier. And I know Tony's lent on both of them as well. So, and whether you go from there and whether you dip into the performance environment, you know, everything is well organised, on process, got structure that people can pick that coaching piece up. They haven't got to worry about something's not being done right somewhere else. And I think that helps us, you know, be able to pick up a new person quite quickly and get them onboarded and get running with it. And naturally, every single head coach that comes is going to want to tweak and have a different approach. But that's really, really good for us as well, because we have to adapt and we want to keep evolving. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need someone to come in and go, you know, actually, that I've seen that done like this somewhere and you can review it. And actually, yeah, we need to probably tweak that. That's a good idea, that is. So there's, there's a really good thing about getting new people in the business because they see it slightly differently and that's how you're going to evolve and get better. You mentioned it there, didn't you? I think he said that, Tony, after the, the Rotherham game, 3-0, we were excellent, weren't we? And he said, I haven't had to do a lot. You know, we've come in, the lads are in a good position. Credit to the, the staff that are already here. And I think, as you yeah. say, Mike Dodds and, and Procky as well have both been in and around the first team for the last yeah. year or so, haven't they? So. And, credit, and credit to the boys as well. Like, yeah. you know, the performers when we played Doncaster and um, Cheltenham, wasn't it? We're, we're, we're reasonably good performers. Mm. As you look at how we played against Norwich, mm. you know, yeah. the, the, the lads have got an attitude and an application which is second to none. Um, you know, and I think they should, like you said, they should, that should be recognised because I think it's, it's all right performing when obviously all the rest of the environmental factors are pretty, you know, got some structure yeah. to them. When it's a little bit up in the air, that, you know, it's an easy excuse, isn't it? Oh, we didn't have the coach. Oh, we weren't prepared. You don't see that from them. They, they adapt and they get on with it. And, and I think that's why it's, it's a group that's so easily sort of lovable, isn't it? Because you see that energy, that determination. And whether you're external as fans or whether you're internal as staff, you want to work with the group, you want to watch the group, you want to see the group, you want to spend time with the group. He's got this uh, international break as well right now. How important is that for Tony Mowbray and his group of players? And what will they be doing in this period of time? 
Well, I think it's a really good opportunity to reflect. I mean, if you think poor Tony, you know, he sort of arrives, then all of a sudden it's like, meet, meet 100 people. <laughs> game, game, game. Um, game, 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 you know. Two away trips, yeah. Press, press, really. press after everything. I think, you know, it can be a whirlwind. But look at the look at the the way in which he goes about his work and the calmness of which he goes about his work means that everyone else is calm, which I think is another real positive. What is he doing in these next couple of weeks? Well, at the minute we're doing a lot of review and reflection in terms of, you know, for us it's easy, isn't it? Because we know the players. For all the new players, we've watched all the players. So we have a much bigger insight probably than, than, than the two coaches do. So we're trying to upskill them a little bit on some of that background, which is important. Um, we've got a cohort of players obviously naturally that are away now which is really really good because we've got some international players um, we've got some players who need a little bit extra of top up that haven't maybe played as many minutes and some of them are going to play Friday night in the game on the 21s um, and then there's a group of players that need a little bit of a rest and need a little bit of a reset you know you look at some of our performance um, uh, outputs in the games miles above last season um, which is really really pleasing because they're showing the ability to adapt and work at a different level but also, I think, you know, with 10 games in, you're going to see a little bit of fatigue coming in, um, which maybe we saw a little bit of on Saturday, and they just need an opportunity to get a little bit of a breather. I'd love to uh, sit down with Tony soon, if we can, on the, on the podcast, Good. if we can make that happen. He mm. seems to be, uh, he comes across as a very nice man, and within football, he's got a really good reputation of being a nice man. What's he like around the academy? I mean, his first class, we, we got him in on the, I think we can't remember what day his first day was, but we put training back, because... Um, Naturally, we needed a little bit of an opportunity to get a little breather and get prepped and organised. And he spent all morning walking around talking and chatting to people, but not not chatting to people in terms of hey, the depth of the conversation, what you're working on, offering advice, you know, sitting with the coaches, um, which was really, really nice to see. Apart from the fact that I was having to fast track him around a little bit because I'm like, we've got training. <laughs> but that's just the type of guy he is. Yeah. You know, I think he's, he lives by, he'd often say he lives by those values. I think it's okay and interesting, isn't it, when people do press, podcasts, whatever it is, you know, you can, it's do you live it? And he certainly lives it. You know, and he was recently the, asked as well in a press conference, a very important question, what's his, what would be his pick and a pick and mix? And he said pineapple chunks or cola cubes, uh, which seems to be a bit of a theme in press conferences at the moment. Christian, put it to you, what's your favourite thing in a pick and mix? Favourite thing in a pick and mix? You know what, I've got old school, you know those little mice with the sugary things on them? Oh, yeah, good mice, yeah. I'd always go for that, but I only like two or three because they're a little bit sickly, those little things, aren't they? Danny? I'm, I'm rhubarb and custard or pear oh, drops. You I can't go. be rhubarb and rhubarb custard. Rhubarb and custard, fairness. yeah. Old school. Oh, so I'm not sure that's pick and mix, is it? Is it pick and mix? Yeah, yeah. you can have know. anything in a pick and mix, yeah. Pineapple it's chunks, I don't know. Um, can yeah. you give us a, an update uh, off the field in terms of the, the club structure and maybe uh, how things with the ownership is going? Uh, Kirill obviously delighted with promotion, I imagine. Has that changed his uh, plans or focus? With are, are you in constant conversation with him still? Oh yeah, constant conversation. Yeah, um, Kirill's are obsessed by obviously what's going on with what's going on with the club, and he's absolutely in tune with every working part. Um, so from that perspective, look, I think he's obviously pleased. You know, I spent some time with them at the game. You know, they don't miss games. You know, they're, they're here you know regularly. Obviously, when we had the change of coach, Kirill's here the next morning. Let's get on with it. Let's sort out what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So it's really really nice to have that level of support. Um, and obviously they're really, really pleased. It doesn't change anything because our strategy and everything that works underneath that strategy continues as, as normal. There's no really big, big upheavals and changes. Um, but, you know, I think in terms of behind the scenes, you know, we've just invested, I think, just short of 200 grand on a brand new gym in this summer. And that was, that was signed off even as a League One team. I think that shows the level of commitment from the ownership to keep improving what's here at AOL. Um, we, you know, we've had some new members of staff join as we're trying to build out the team. You know, um, Jamie Harley's joined us in the head of performance and medical. Had a really good start in that position, making some really good positive strides, um, which is really really important for us. That's a real area of focus. Um, and like I said, when you've got some infrastructure investment like the gym, we're giving people the right type of environment, the right equipment to operate at their very very best. So um, that side of it's all, all really, really positive. Um, like I said, it's, it's a constantly evolving piece of work. You know, we're, we're, we want to be, we want to be performing at a higher level all the time. So we're constantly trying to review and reflect on that. Um, and I think if supporters had the opportunity to sort of get an insight into all those little pieces, which I think is something we probably should try to do in some way, or shape or form, then I think they would get a lot of um, a lot of confidence in what's happening behind the scenes. I think it's really difficult for supporters, isn't it? Because you look at it, they see the tip of the iceberg. They see the match on Saturday, yeah. 
and it's really interesting because obviously for them it, that's the whole iceberg isn't it that's because that's all you see for others there's so much is underneath the water that they don't probably get an insight to so trying to open that up i think would be important well if we can help with that on the podcast yeah no i mean I, you know, I think like you said it'd be great to get some sort of that like introducing series where we could introduce some of those especially those those members of the leadership team are leading on certain elements um i think would be really really interesting because like we don't want to we want obviously ask our supporters to understand and have confidence in what we're doing and sometimes it's difficult isn't it because it's you're giving them limited information <laughs> it's like me sitting here and having every confidence i know every single piece of information and what we want to try to do is obviously give them as much of that as possible that they can feel comfort in what's going on. doesn't mean we're going to win every Saturday, but what we are trying to do is we're trying, to, we're trying our best to win every Saturday and we're also trying to do our best to win every Saturday in the future. Well, funny enough, on, on Saturday you asked me after the, after the game, didn't you, on the post-match show, and how would I assess the season so far? We're obviously coming up to, to the quarter quarter stage mark really on a couple of games away from it 10 games in you said you're not allowed to look at the table until you 10 games I said yeah get to 10 games then we'll look at the table obviously we're sat in the, in the playoff spots and yes it's early days but from my point of view and I, you probably agree we've played a lot of teams that are in several teams in the top half of the table would you say there's anything to fear in this league from our point of view I think I don't think we've been out of any games by any stretch um, I think you know you look at the Sheffield United game it's a difficult one to gauge with Dan getting sent off after half an hour but the lads Rally, didn't they? Got the goal second half. Yeah. Um, Norwich here, nothing in it. And you look at the table and you think, do you know what? We're, we're amongst it here. Um, is there some ambition in there as if to say we could go all the way and push that? Or is it too early to look at that? You're laughing at me now. <laughs> well, what was he trying to get me to say? What, 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 what was the objective then? What was the objective this, this season? Well, the, the objective for us, I've said previously, was to, was to adapt and consolidate. You know, how fast we're going to adapt physically, how that fast we're going to adapt, you know, tactically to the game's performance. You know, you, know you don't really know in some degrees because there's so many players, you've quite rightly said, never played. You know, we had about eight or nine players never played in the championship. So straight away, we're looking at that. So now we're looking at, we've okay started, we've started to get through that adapting stage, if you like. And now it's a case of trying to put pressure on the players in terms of like, you know, we've got to maintain that ability to be competitive in every game. So I certainly want us to be competitive every game. I certainly want supporters, owners, members of staff to turn up at the game going we could win this game now I'd like to think that every game we've played you see our identity in terms of how we've tried to approach the games we've tried to win every game <laughs> and I think at some point in every game we've had the chance to win every game which I think is impressive I didn't realise actually till, till literally this weekend when somebody mentioned to me we'd played I think seven out of the top ten I think it is isn't it yeah, um, yeah so. which, which obviously is quite interesting in terms of just how those games have fallen I don't think that means that the next 10 are easier. <laughs> no, no. Um, sure. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't think there's enough points between the teams for, to maybe structure that. But you can understand why fans are maybe getting carried away uh, in some terms because 10 games in, we find ourselves fifth and our best players have been out. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a really optimistic position, isn't it? And that's what we want. Nobody at the club wants to not get promoted. I think what we're just trying to do is we're just trying to manage expectation, which is, yeah. you know, we want to be a team that's consistently performing so what's the danger this year well the danger is we've only played 10 games so can we maintain that level for 20 games can we maintain that level for 30 games um, and I think that's obviously becomes a test because it's a slight war of attrition isn't it over the 46 game nine month period would we assess it then obviously we've got this break now with the internationals uh, go again against Preston a week on Saturday then we get that block of games in before the break for the World Cup would you then assess it after that building into the transfer window, see where we're at and then gauge out in terms of where we are with injuries and, and, and looking forward from it from that Yeah, point. yeah. We did an original plan. Coming out the back of the window, there was 14 games to the break. Yeah. Um, and I think there was four to the window after the, after the World Cup break. Um, so we'd map that out that obviously we would have a, a, a more, a more in-depth review during that World Cup period. Now, that's not to say that, you know, I've seen some media reports, you know, if we're in seventh place, going to the window, Tony's getting a war chest and all this. It's <laughs> utter. Know what like. <laughs> it's, I, know, but it, I know, but it's miscommunication yeah, as well. Yeah, so yeah. I, I need to be really, really clear. It's not, what we're going to do is we're going to keep building in the manner that we've kept building in. And when there's opportunities to sign the right types of players, then, then, we're, then, then we're going to try to sign the right types of players. What we're not going to do is, is make... Uh, decisions that have got long-term effect of, to fix a short-term problem you know so from our perspective we want to keep growing and keep developing what we can't start to do is make a series of bad decisions 
which puts us in a worse place further down the line. I think in the championship, you know, the very fact that we're probably the third highest net spenders, the championship at the minute is in a little bit of a quandary where yeah. you've got a lot of clubs at the minute aren't able to aren't able to spend money on players and have certainly tried to shuffle their pack uh, using free transfers and loans. Mm -hmm. So is there anything to fear in the league? No, I don't think there's anything to fear in the league, but I never thought there would be for us because I think we're a good footballing team mm -hmm. yeah. and I've got every confidence that we could be successful. Can we be successful enough <laughs> is the question. Mm -hmm. And I think as we go further down into our sort of uh, tenure in the championship, I think then we've obviously then got to start putting more pressure on performing and, and obviously operating at the top end of the table. But I think it's a really nice thing, isn't it, when you see, like, you know, supporters, you know, optimistic, enthusiastic, excited about the team. That's why you want to support a football club. Yeah. No, I agree. I think I, you say, and I said it at the start of the season, I think at this level it maybe suits us a little bit more where a lot of teams at League One, they come up here, they pack it in, sit deep, don't they, and it becomes... They stifle the game really, whereas I think championship teams will come and have a more of a go. And a lot of the games have been a bit of a basketball match, haven't they? Even a QPR game, two minutes in, I said on the comms, quite look at this here, they've had a couple of opportunities, and so have we. But I think that'll suit the, the, the players we've got at the top end of the pitch, what we've got available. You know, Pritchard, Roberts, as you see, Jack Clark, Embleton coming in, the strikers, we've got to, uh, lads there who are going to hurt the opposition. Look at the goals we're scoring. Yeah, I think, look, it comes down to, especially at the top end of these these types of leagues, it's moments in the game, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? And I think you can get lots of games which can ebb and flow. It's the moments where those players step up, they even make that tackle. You know, I think, did Dan Ballard make one? I can't remember what game it was, early in the season. He's made a couple of good ones, hasn't he? In the you know, box, yeah. they're as good as goals, yeah. you know what I mean, in some respects. So, you, you know, what happens in both penalty boxes is really, really important. I think it's been, it's been nice to see that, you know, we've been structurally quite defensively sound. But yeah, we've had an opportunity. You know, I think we're third or fourth high scorers, scorers. in the league. I yeah. think you know. So, you know, I think we've got that ability to convert possession in the final third, whether it's in transition or whether it's through some structured possession, to be able to score goals. And I think if you haven't got teeth in this league, then you're in real danger. And I think we've just got attacking threats all over the place, even with. You know, as at the present time, we're fortunately missing a couple. Yeah, and I think away form as well. I think we're second. Wigan were top before yeah. the weekend's game. I'm not sure I'll be sitting now, but we were second in away form, weren't we? And I think, as you say, you'd expect the opposition maybe at home to have a little bit more of the ball. But apart from Reading last week, who uh, didn't see too much of the ball. But yeah, just on that counter attack, isn't it? Them turnovers where we look like we can hurt the opposition. And maybe, you know, a lot of people say make your home ground your fortress and try and nick something on the, on the road. At this moment in time, it's perhaps been a little bit of the reverse of that, hasn't it? Where we've, we've we've got a few wins on the road and it's just trying to get that home form going again, I guess. Yeah, I think we've played more away games, haven't we? Yeah, we, we have, yeah. Um, I think we've played six and four, haven't we? I think. But yeah. uh, unlucky in a couple of those home games as well. I'd say the Queen's Park range, you should go back to that one. 2 nil up with five minutes I to go. I can't. My mind will not let me go back to that one, Danny. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what game you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah. The road did that out of my thinking. But look, I think that, you know, no one wants to come and play at Stadium Alive, you know. We're packing that place full of like 38,000 people at the minute. It'd be great, like, you know, if we could play Preston, you know, I think people would come and get behind the team. You know, if we could get 40,000 people at that game week on Saturday, you know, it has a big impact on the players. Yeah, I was going to say, how much impact does that have on the players? And do they report back to you how it feels to them to play in front of the crowd? Yeah, I mean, statistically, people have done the stats, haven't they, over COVID and said it makes no difference. But, you know, it might make no difference statistically I suppose from that perspective but from an emotion of the players I mean you've only got I mean I was chatting to Adji the other day you know Adji's like this is incredible you know what I mean it, and the players want to come and play in front of that you know they're entertainers aren't they you know they want to they want to show their art their yeah. what they do in front of people and I think that does get an extra 10% out of them and I think if you're a Sunderland player you're going out to that 40,000 people those banners that 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 level of noise um you know, and let's be honest, on some of our away games, it's felt like home games. I mean, yeah. like the Watford game on Saturday. I mean, down there, and, yeah. Yeah. Saturday Saturday. Week. and then, you know, we score and there's people in the Watford then celebrating. I'm like, this can't be right. <laughs> What's going on here? And I think there's obviously one or two maybe Where snuck in. Where ticket from? <laughs> one or two have snuck in. Yeah. But again, that just shows you the desire to people want to come and support. You know, we sell out our end and then people are trying to find other ways, which I suppose is uh, it's not correct, but... It's obviously nice to see in terms of the vibrancy it brings and um, yeah, our way support's been phenomenal, hasn't it? I mean, like, yeah. you know, I think that's, you know, been well documented how much the players have enjoyed that. But we obviously want to get as many people into SOL as possible. Yes. Come and support the team. So and take over everywhere they go, as the song goes. Yeah. Um, I guess your main attention coming round will be the next transfer window. 
Uh, and if that is true, have you already started and what would be the process going into that? Yeah, so we've got a review meeting on Thursday. So we always do a transfer review meeting on Thursday. Um, so we'll do that piece of work. Then what we'll do is we'll take a bit of time to evaluate where we're at. Obviously, part of that is obviously um, getting getting our head coach up to speed, I suppose, and up to speed probably doesn't sound right, but getting him with all the information and obviously getting a batch of games that he can see those players in training and games and form an opinion, which is really, really important. Um, and then when say when we come around to that World Cup break, we'll do a player audit and then we'll start to look in terms of where we need to go. We've already got a, a, a rough sketched out idea about where we want to go and what positions we want to try to target because we're trying to build window on window, which is what we've always done. Um, and then obviously when it comes around to it, we'll, we'll try to assess the where the market's at and what players with what player availability it looks like. I think we said before January is a treacherous window, isn't it, to a certain yeah. degree? Um, so. You know, I think most of our good work's done in the summer. But having said that, we've obviously also made some really good signings in the winter when we signed Ross Stewart, signed Jack Clark, Patrick Roberts. You know, even though those were on loan, they were part of the process to obviously get them in the building full time. And I guess in these periods of pause in the season, you get to take a breath and step back and look at the the academy squads and the women's team as well. And this would be the time when you you know get into that. Yeah, there's a, there's a big piece of work going around workforce development with the women's team. So we've got some meetings coming up this week, next week on that, which is really going to expand that program, give us a lot more infrastructure. Which is, a, which is a really, really good project. Alex has done really, really well with that. Obviously, we've had a big transition of moving some staff full-time in the women's programme. Um, we've done a, a lot of work behind the scenes on nutrition. You know, we're changing how our refectory works, we're looking at it as a sort of a performance support unit, um, what type of nutrition. We just had a new nutritionist start with us. Emmy's had a really, really good start affecting all the squads from nine through to the first team. Um, and we've obviously got an interview process going in the minute for a caddy manager, which we're halfway through. So that'll be some news coming up in the next couple of weeks in terms of a new position there. And what does the academy manager, what are they responsible for? The academy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, play, play, the, our player development programme, you know, from nines all the way through to 23s. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the structure of the academy and how the academy operates, obviously, has evolved quite a lot, certainly evolved quite a lot here. We're looking for someone to come in and, and from, a, from a leadership and a strategic perspective, be able to um, plot and operate that program to where we want to get, be able to get it to. Um, we've obviously got this performance domain model and it's for the academy manager to work across all those performance domains to make sure that for academy teams, that, that they are obviously doing everything we need to be doing to either um, develop players, retain players, and obviously support those players and families to make sure we're obviously giving them everything they need. Um, and it's a really, really exciting time for someone to come in and pick that project up. Danny, anything good. else from you? No, all good, yeah. Appreciate the, appreciate your time and uh, all the best, Christian. Thanks yeah, very much. Best, yeah. Thanks very much. No, thanks for coming out, guys. It's always uh, good to try and give everyone a bit of an update on what's going on. Um, like I said, we're really, really excited, so hopefully uh, we can catch up again. So myself and Danny are back outside the Academy of Light, having just had a sit down there with Christian Speakman. Um, do you feel like we got all the answers we needed for the uh, supporters there, Danny? Yeah, I think, uh, as usual, he was fairly honest with us. And, uh, you know, we, we asked him about the manager situation, um, obviously a lot of transfers and, and, and generally the model in which he's brought to the club over the last couple of seasons and, you know, the direction we're, we're trying to go in. Um, you know, obviously bringing in a lot of young boys, uh, obviously unproven at this level. But as we've seen at the weekend, uh, they stepped up and uh, and hopefully there's there's more to come from these lads. And uh, but no, I thought it was a good sit down, a good good conversation with him. And uh, still got a busy period to come, hasn't he? In the, in January. Yes, and perhaps a busy period for us during this international break. I think we're going to bring you another sit down with uh, a member of the staff here at the Academy of Light, be it playing or uh, coaching, I don't know who yet, but we have been told we'll be bringing you another podcast very soon here on SFC Unfiltered, so don't forget to subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use. Uh, For now, though, we'll see you soon.